We like to think about the built environment as essentially making up the human habitat. So whether you're talking about the neighborhood in which you live in, the broader community and where you visit friends and hang out on the weekends to the, to the central business district where you may go to work, the city and the region that you live in, the built environment is all of that. It's where we, where we live our lives. The built environment is go downtown in your favorite urban, urban environment, like any city, and just stand still and look around. And anything from the buildings to the sidewalk to the stoplight to the bus coming down the you know coming down the street, all these things encapsulate for me what is the built environment. When you think about the role that the built environment has from a climate perspective, and, and as we now look at climate change and the energy transition, it has a significant role in what our future looks like. So it's a it has a massive impact, and therefore. Uh, a significant opportunity to lead us towards a more sustainable, green, carbon neutral future. Achieving systems transformation for the built environment sector at the pace and scale that is required will not be possible without alignment and collaboration from all stakeholders across the entire value chain. A huge transformational change is needed to shift to a net zero and resilient built environment. Informed by the Climate Action Pathways, the UN High Level Climate Action Champions are driving non-state actor climate ambition across all stakeholders and view this systems transformation as an S-curve for change. For the built environment, this systems transformation will ultimately converge at our long-term 2050 goal to ensure that all new and existing buildings and infrastructure assets a net zero across their whole life cycle. As this S-curve thinking highlights, to kickstart the exponential increase and to ultimately win the race to zero emissions by 2050, the world must achieve the near-term 2030 breakthrough, described as a tipping point. For the built environment sector, this 2030 breakthrough outcome is defined as 100% of projects completed in 2030 or after a net zero carbon in operation with at least 40% embodied carbon reduction within the design. As a team, we've thought about the critical levers within the built environment system which can drive change within our sector and have honed in on contractors, architects, engineers, asset managers and real estate investment companies. We're striving to get 20% of key actors globally from these stakeholder groups to commit by 2023 to joining the race to zero using the momentum of COP26 and 2021 as a pivotal year for climate action. The world is currently undergoing the largest wave of urban growth in human history. More than half the global population is now concentrated in urban areas, and by 2060, two thirds of the expected global population of 10 billion will live in cities. Within our cities, buildings generate nearly 40% of annual global greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, to meet Paris climate agreement targets, we must eliminate all greenhouse gas emissions from the built environment by 2040, and to advocate for all buildings to be net zero carbon in operation by 2050. Net zero can be achieved at various scales in the built environment, from individual buildings right up to precincts and cities and typically through a range of on-site and off-site solutions. As soon as you think about your assets or projects more holistically, an opportunity arises to reduce emissions more directly and in a more impactful way. Each built environment net zero story is unique. Whilst they all have their own strategies, complexities and opportunities, they share a common absolute and ambitious goal to achieve net zero carbon in operation. No matter where you are on your sustainability and net zero journey, there are numerous ways to make meaningful change within the built environment. Here we feature the net zero vision for Monash University's Clayton campus. The university's largest campus with 40,000 students and 85 buildings in Melbourne, Australia. In particular, this segment will focus on the strategy Monash is taking to get to net zero emissions. 
We know what the science says about climate change. We know that transformational change is required. And we know that the world understands that to achieve the climate goals outlined in the Paris Climate Agreement, we all need to take action. So in 2016, Monash decided to start the journey to net zero emissions by 2030. We made an investment of 135 million. We recognise that it's an ambitious target to hit net zero emissions for a university such as ourselves, and that will require transformational change across the university. Our decarbonisation challenges are significant. We're trying to build portfolio diversity. We're a small suburb like a mini city with a large diversity of building types in, our, in the portfolio, offices, teaching, laboratories, sports, residential, retail. We've been poorly serviced by public transport, but we do have rail transport coming to the campus after 2030. We're a large research intensive organisation. We use around 100 gigawatts of annual energy usage, so we can't source 100% of our renewable energy on site. We need to keep our lights on, so the reliability of energy is important to us. We can't have unreliable energy because it can impact critical research. Many of the research samples in our freezers, for example, have been collected over decades. For them to go out would could be catastrophic to some of the research activities we're undertaking. The key pillars of our net zero strategy include energy efficiency, electrification, on-site and off-site renewable energy, A-grid interactive microgrid, and where we can't deliver net zero through those means, offsetting residual admissions. To improve the energy of our efficiency of our campuses, uh, we're upgrading our lighting to LEDs with over 45,000 fittings deployed to date. We're upgrading our building control systems to enable real-time AI-driven building optimization. And we're also engaging with our staff and students to embed sustainability in both the workplace as well as their living place for example, used through our Green Impact Program. Since committing to net zero emissions, we've constructed four large-scale all-electric buildings, two of which have received Passive House certification. And we're progressively electrifying our existing buildings through replacing our inefficient gas boilers with high-efficiency electric heat pumps. We're also developing grid interactive campus microgrid solutions to enable our campuses to align their energy consumption with renewable energy generation and support the broader uptake of renewals in the national electricity grid. And for emissions that we can't yet eliminate, such as air travel, our researchers are working on alternative fuels, such as green hydrogen and ammonia, and we're investing in other offset projects that have a positive ecological and social impact such as regenerative planting. We've seen significant campus growth in the past seven years. Gross energy usage is up, but energy intensity is down 10% due to the net zero initiatives I've previously mentioned. It was a challenge to build industry capability around new buildings, but around all of our existing infrastructure. Um, essentially at the moment, just over half. So when we started, just over half of our um, energy came from natural gas. Um, and we've got that down to about 40% in 2020. Um, but essentially, it's still a really big challenge. We've had some proof of concepts. We've trialled some things. We were looking at doing um, precinct solutions rather than doing building by building. Uh, and where we've gotten to is basically we've engaged an industry partner to work on us at the whole of campus precinct scale um, to do an energy as a service solution to help us accelerate the transformation and hit our 2030 target. It's just physically impossible to um, generate all the energy we need on site. So we have to go off site to get renewable energy. Um, at the time we were doing this around 2016, 2017, it was a relatively new concept in Australia. So it was pretty uncommon. In fact, there was only one other organization that had done it at the time to contract with a, a wind farm or a solar farm. So that was probably a big challenge. And thankfully the market's really shifted in Australia. And now there is um, a significant number of corporate entities that have done a power purchase agreement with the renewable energy project, making sure what we have constructed and delivered um, is actually performing, is actually delivering energy savings and carbon emission savings. 
So a big way that we are keeping ourselves accountable is that we have certified the finance and the projects with the Climate Bond Institute, um, which requires us to do um, an annual audited assurance on how the buildings are performing to show that they are on a low carbon um, trajectory towards net zero by 2030. When Monash started its journey, our focus was on electrifying our existing campuses. So eliminating the emissions that we generate through the operation of our campuses and then balancing that electrical demand with renewable energy from the grid. As the word net describes, we were looking to do this on a net basis, ensuring that we put 100% of our energy requirements into the grid to offset effectively the amount of energy that we were using on our campuses. So this is what we call net zero emissions. And net zero emissions is a great start, but it's not the end game. We need to be matching our energy demand in real time to the energy generation from renewable energy sources. This looks like controlling the shape of our demand to match those peaks and troughs that come with intermittent energy supplies such as wind and solar. Pleasingly for most of us, the wind blows relatively stably overnight and certainly in Australia we have an abundance of solar energy in the day. So the shape of our energy portfolio looks quite closely to what a 100% renewable powered wind and solar grid looks like but it's these shoulder periods, these periods in between that are the challenging part. So we're looking to not just activate our campuses to allow them to be more flexible to match a renewable energy grid. We're looking to empower other campuses, other city occupants, other large demands so they can become more flexible and we can coordinate together to make sure that our collective demand matches this collective generation profile, which not only reduces the carbon intensity towards zero, but also reduces the total cost of energy supply allowing us to enjoy the great benefits that energy provides in our modern life. What we are doing is not for Monash, but through Monash, through our education and research, we will help to address the global challenges of the age. And that means that the initial $135 million investment that was transforming our campuses into test beds and showcases of net zero emissions is really just the beginning because what we are doing is taking that operational investment, if you like, and leveraging that through our education and research capability, which is much bigger and broader, and working very strongly to partner with industry and partner with communities around us to develop the solutions and the market capability to accelerate our global economy and society towards net zero emissions. The Monash University example demonstrates the importance of having a strong commitment, continual improvement, and the role of individual buildings in a campus net zero strategy. What happens when we scale the net zero story up to include not just one or two campuses, but multiple campuses? The University of California net zero story involves an entire university ecosystem across the state of California in the U.S. Within the United States, the healthcare industry emits approximately 10% of the country's greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a significant challenge for healthcare organizations. We're a very energy intensive operation. Uh, here at UC Davis Health, our largest greenhouse gas emitter is our cogeneration plant, which uh, utilizes 97% of the natural gas that we procure to generate 86% of our electricity needs. The benefits to that facility is that it's a very reliant energy source for us. We're able to be self-sufficient and generate our own electricity. Uh, we um, also have a secondary backup in terms of our connection to our local um, utility provider, um, which is the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, or SMUD. And then thirdly, we have um, generators. Um, so we have a very redundant um, sources of power. Um, and also the, the co-generation plan is a very cost-effective model for us. We're able to generate our own electricity for about half the cost of procuring it. But that being said, it, it is our largest greenhouse gas emitter. So what we're doing to address that is um, similar to um, modeling after what the UC system is doing. So working on reducing our energy demands, doing retro commissioning of buildings, um, doing installations of, of LED lighting, et cetera. So working on that demand side. Then secondly, you know, as new construction comes online, 
designing that to be as energy efficient as possible. Uh, we're also looking into expanding um, our utilization of solar and other renewables. We're looking at procurement of biogas in lieu of natural gas. Um, and then lastly, um, if there's a gap there to close, um, looking at um, meaningful, intentional offsets. Um, there's a, a, a group within the UC system that is working on developing UC uh, offset projects that will utilize faculty and students, be a research opportunity and education opportunity, as well as lend itself towards being, as I mentioned earlier, an intentional, meaningful offset. University of California has really been a leader for many years in climate research. And um, President Napolitano back in um, 2013 decided that we really needed to demonstrate our leadership and our commitment to sustainability throughout our business practices. So she announced our carbon neutrality initiative, which is striving for net greenhouse gas emissions in our buildings and our vehicle fleet by 2025. And the UC uh, system is approaching this through a myriad of ways. First, through reducing energy consumption and energy demand. Secondly, striving to uh, generate uh, and procure uh, renewable energy as, as extensively as we can. Um, and then based on the location, there's different opportunities, different challenges, but looking at those you know, opportunities and how we could leverage those um, to continue to advance uh, reducing carbon emissions. I'm paraphrasing the vision statement here a bit, but in essence, we're striving to be um, a healthcare model of resiliency and sustainability that celebrates the connection between human health and environmental health. And we intend to do that through intentional actions, engagement, education, uh, to really enhance the lives of all for generations to come. So in addition to um, carbon reduction, another challenge within healthcare is um, Healthcare is, is a large generator of waste. Um, nationally, on average, healthcare organizations and hospitals generate about 14,000 tons of waste per day, which equates to about 5 million tons per year. And about 25% of that is uh, plastic, plastic packaging, single-use plastics. So here at the UC, or at UC Davis Health, um, we're generating currently about 34 pounds of waste per adjusted patient day. That's our normalizer to account for fluctuations with patient levels. And we have set a goal, the UC system has set a goal um, to reduce that to 25 pounds per adjusted patient day. So we are working on a myriad of waste reduction projects, um, looking at single use plastic items that we currently utilize and exploring reusable options. I think what gets me excited is the interconnection between health, climate, equity, sustainability, how interwoven all of those components are. Uh, my background, my undergrad is environmental science and then I pursued a master's of public health and really came to the realization, had this aha moment many, many years ago that these, these things are connected. And it's exciting to see the revelation that these are accepted. Like I used, I used to have to explain, like when I would say, well, I have a master's in public health, but I'm a sustainability officer, folks would kind of look at me funny, you know, like what's the connection there? I don't get those looks anymore. So for me, that's really exciting um, to be able to just jump into this work. And there's kind of that general understanding that yes, these, these are all interconnected. And uh, and I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the spirit of collaboration across the UC is super exciting to me. And I get really passionate when I can engage with students. Um, they, they know that their future entails dealing with these climate change challenges head on. And I love working to support them, um, to help them as much as I possibly can to be uh, really, um, active and engaged sustainability professionals, you know, in their, after they complete their, their college education. So it's really great, you know, collaborative um, effort because as you know, climate change is a very daunting issue. It's the issue of our time and we don't have time to recreate wheels. Um, so let's share what we know and continue to advance our work collaboratively.
Decarbonisation of the built environment is difficult when you're in control of your own assets. But when we look to large urban developments or major event programs like the Olympics or World Expos, you're faced with the challenge of having to manage complex stakeholder ecosystems with their own drivers and motivations and no single decision maker. If successfully designed and implemented, these complex environments represent a huge amount of opportunity in respect to decarbonisation. But to make it work, you have to get everyone aligned and moving in the same direction. Built environment has a, has a significant impact on global emissions. Estimated at nearly 40% of all, of all carbon emissions come from the buildings, come from operation of our hospitals, our airports, our office buildings, even the houses that we live in. And so it has a significant impact on the problem that has been created and therefore will play a, a giant role in any version of a greener, cleaner, more carbon neutral future. I think clients' expectations are changing. I mean, there definitely was a time when, when the this, this sustainability conversation was viewed, was viewed as, a, as an add-on or a nice to have. That's certainly no longer the case. I think when we now begin to talk about decarbonization, what does net zero mean? And we like to think about net zero from the perspective of water, waste, and energy. So again, we talk about complexity building on complexity. So while they expect us as a as a solutions provider and they expect our partners and our teammates and actually the entire industry to be bringing those best practices to the table, um, not just as an add-on, but as a, as a core part of what we're doing for them. I do think that there still is a, a significant amount of not just confusion, but really a challenge in the marketplace because these are, these are lofty goals to achieve what we need to achieve to make, to make an impact. And, and the complexity makes it difficult. So, yeah, there's an expectation that we're going to do the right thing and we're bringing that as a part of our everyday story. But the challenge is how do we do it together? Because it's not easy. And that's, that's also the opportunity is to really lean into a, a complicated yet very important messy problem and work together, clients and teammates and partners, to really come up with that integrated solution. To influence policy, civil society can also write to local politicians, CEOs, and even universities to help implement changes at policy level. Civil society can demand transparency around how our homes, schools, hospitals, and workplaces are developed. For homeowners, simple steps that individuals can take is to understand the energy performance of their homes and make improvements in efficiency, along with switching energy suppliers to a lower emissions supply. Ultimately, the cost of our inaction now is that our global building stock will not be able to withstand future climate shocks. These shocks are the impacts of the rising global emissions that the construction process itself contributes to. By signing up to the Race to Zero, such stakeholders across the built environment sector commit to halving their emissions by 2030 across scopes one, two, and three. This showcase of a critical mass of non-state actors committing will in turn send a resounding ambition signal to policymakers and governments to go further faster in their efforts to decarbonize. The built environment influences the way people live and work every day, everywhere. Homes being built even today are not up to the standard to meet zero carbon targets and we will not meet our targets without a near complete decarbonisation of the housing stock. Civil society can use our collective voice to send a strong message to governments to retrofit, build back better and establish a green recovery through reducing global energy demands and decarbonising our heat and energy generation. For us, the, the built environment is really about the human habitat and, and what can we do as an organisation, as a, as a group of designers, planners, engineers, strategists, thinkers, uh, come to, what can we do to come together and to really have the kind of impact that we want and know that we need to have, not just want to have, but know that we need to have. I mean, uh, research points to the impact of the built environment. This is clearly still the century of the city as, as global migration continues to move into our urban environments. And that's not just our large CBDs, that's our small towns, that's our communities. And we feel like we have, uh, have not only a, a responsibility, but an opportunity to really have a very positive impact. And that's one of the things that's most exciting to me as I look at our team across cities and places within Jacobs, is to step in and, and bring our best every day and make sure that we are 
are working together, blurring lines, radically integrating expertise across our teams and across the organization to have the kind of impact that we can on the built environment, but also on our planet as a whole.